how your phone's autocorrect knows TEH means the how search engines find relevant pages and how AI like chatbots can hold conversations. It all starts with tuning words into numbers. Think about how a computer understands text. Computers ultimately work with numbers, not letters or words. So we want a machine to understand a language. We need to convert words into numbers. Hi, I am Mayank Pratap Singh and I am excited to deep dive into the world of word embeddings with you guys. Early on, a simple solution was to assign each word an ID number, like an index in a dictionary. For example, we might say apple is 1, banana is 2, cat is 3, and so on. By this, we are giving each word a unique numeric identifier. But there is a problem. These IDs carry no information about the meaning. The number 3 doesn't tell the computer that cat is an animal or that it's more similar to dog than to a banana. It is just a label. To preserve more information, researchers tried representing it into one hot vector. A one hot vector is like a long binary code for each word, mostly zeros with a single one at the position corresponding to the word. If cat is the third word in our vocabulary, its one hot vector might look like 00100 with a one in the third slot. This technique is simple and works as basic numeric representation, but it still has major drawbacks. One hot vectors get very large and sparse, basically a long list of zeros, if you have a lot of words. More importantly, they don't capture any relations or meaning with other words. A one hot encoding thinks that cat is as unrelated to dog as it is to table, since every word's vector is equally different, sharing no common ones. In other words, one hot vectors do not capture meaning. Another early approach was bag of words. Instead of representing individual words, Bag of words represents the entire piece of text by counting the occurrence of each word. You basically make a big vocabulary list and count how many times each word appears, turning the text into a numerical frequency vector. This captures which words are present and how often, but it ignores the order of words completely. If you have the sentences, dog bites man and man bites dog, a basic bag of words representation would treat them as the same thing, since both contain one dog one man and one bites. Clearly, word order matters for meaning. Who bit whom in this case? Bag of words loses that information, moreover like one hot vector. The shortcomings of these early techniques made it clear that we need a better way to represent text into numbers. A way that can capture meaning, context and relationships between words, not just identity. How we can give a computer a sense of what words mean? One powerful idea comes from linguistics, that meaning comes from context. There is a famous saying, you should know a word by the company it keeps. In simple terms, this means you can often infer the meaning of the word by looking at the words around it. This is known as distributional hypothesis, which states that words appearing in similar contexts tend to have similar meanings. Think about how you deduce the meaning of an unfamiliar word by reading. If you see a sentence, the glorp is barking, and wagging its tail. You can guess that glorp might be some kind of animal, probably a dog. Even if you have never heard that word before. Why? Because the context, barking, wagging its tail, gives it away. Similarly, if two different words appear in the same sort of context, there is a good chance they relate to a similar thing. For instance, the words like doctor and nurse both appear frequently near words like hospital or patient, so a computer could learn that they are related in meaning. On the other hand, doctor and guitar rarely share context, so their meaning are likely unrelated. This insight presents a strategy that represents each word according to the context in which it appeared. If we can encode the surrounding words into a vector, we get a numeric representation that reflects uses and thus meaning. How often each word appears next to each other word and then factorizing and compressing those tables to get the dense vector. But an even more effective strategy turned out to be letting a machine learning model learn the word vectors by the context automatically. This is where neural network based embeddings came into play. A major pivotal point was making word meaning numeric using models like Word2Vec, which was made by a team at Google in 2013. Word2Vec is not a single algorithm, but a family of related approaches to learn word embeddings, basically you can say dense vector representations, from a large corpus of text. The core idea is straightforward, 
and follows the context is equal to meaning principle. Use the surrounding word or context to predict a target word or vice versa. In doing so, the model learns vectors from the words that make those predictions accurate. Over time, those vectors came to represent a semantic information because to predict a word from its neighbors, the model has to pick up on which word tends to go together. Word to vec popularized two training strategies that implement this idea. Continuous bag of words. You can also say it as SIBO or SIBAO. And the second one is skipgram. They are like two opposite ways to solve the same fill in the blank problem. Let's talk about continuous bag of words. Imagine taking a sentence and hiding one word, then asking the model to guess the missing word based on the other words around it. For example, in the sentence, the cat dash on the mat. The model should predict sat from the context of word which are the cat on the mat. SIBO treats the surrounding context words as input and tries to predict the target, basically the center word. In the beginning, it learns to guess a word from its neighbors. To succeed, the model must internalize the contextual clues. This pressure causes it to learn meaningful word vectors in its hidden layer. Skipgram. Now flip the problem around. In Skipgram, the model has one word and tries to predict the words that are likely to appear around it. For example, given the word coffee, the model might try to predict that words like morning, mug, or bean that often occur nearby the word coffee. In practice, the training takes each word in the sentence as the center and tries to guess its context words. Skipgram is ultimately learning to guess the neighbors from the word. This also forces the model to learn vectors that position similar words in a way that they have similar neighboring distributions. Both SIBO and Skipgram are just simple neural network with one hidden layer. There is nothing magical in their architecture. The magic comes from training 1 million of sentences. Over many repetitions, the model adjusts the word vectors to better predict missing words or neighbors. The end result is a set of vectors, one for each word in the vocabulary, where words that live in similar context are closer together in the vector space, capturing a lot of subtle semantic and syntactic relationships. For example, after training the vector for king, it might end up near queen, prince and royal, while banana would end up closer to apple, fruit or yellow. One famous demonstration of what to big power is that these vectors can sometimes capture the analogies through arithmetic. Let's judge a word based on some certain parameters. We have king, man, woman and queen. So we have a slider in the range of 0 to 10. Now king is very rich. That is why the value of the first vector could be 9. For the gender male, the value will go at 0. King is very powerful. That's why the power value could be 9.5. Let's apply the same for man. These are the vectors. Again, then the same for woman. Now these are the vectors. And here we have the vectors for the word queen. Now you can take the vector for king, subtract the vector for man, then add the vector for woman. And the result is closer to the vector for queen. This suggests that the word has learned aspects of the relationships like gender in its vector geometry. While this analogy math is fun, the key insight is that word embeddings transform raw text into a kind of geometric space of meanings. Each word becomes a point in a multidimensional space and words with similar meaning clusters together in the space. In our new numeric representation, happy might be quite next to joyful, but apple could be far away from dog. By turning words into these learned vectors, we are giving computer a way to calculate the word similarities and associations. Once we have words into vector, how do we actually measure if two words are similar in meaning or not? One common measure is cosine similarity. Without diving into heavy maths, cosine similarity looks at the angle between two word vectors and not their length. Imagine each word vector as an arrow pointing from the origin of this multidimensional space to the point of that word. Cosine similarity asks how close is the direction of arrow A to B? If two words vector point in very similar directions, smaller angle between them, the cosine similarity is high, that is close to 1, meaning the words are likely related. If they are at 90, which is perpendicular, the cosine is 0, indicating no particular similarity. And if they point in opposite directions, 180 apart, the cosine similarity is minus 1, which in word terms might indicate opposites. But in practice, embeddings usually aren't so neatly classified. The nice thing about cosine similarity is that it ignores the magnitude of a vector and focuses only on the orientation. Why it is useful? Because in training, some words might get larger vector values than others. Say, 
very common words might have higher magnitudes but what really encodes meaning is the direction the pattern of values across dimensions cosine similarity effectively normalizes that out in simple terms it checks how much two words point into the same direction in the meaning space so if we want to find which word is more similar to dog in our vocabulary we can compute the cosine similarity between dog's vector and every other word's vector we might find cat has a similarity of 0.8 wolf maybe 0.75 but because banana is not related to dog it could be 0.2 that aligns with our intuitive understanding that dog is more like a cat or wolf and not at all like a banana by using measures like cosine similarity on embeddings llns and other nlp systems can quantitatively compare meanings for example it can be used to find synonyms to detect if a piece of text matches a query or to cluster words by topics by now it is well understood that every word in the modern nlp is stored as vector of numbers commonly referred as word embeddings but it raises a important question what do these numbers actually mean why does each word have a different vector this is where the concept of interpretability comes into play interpretability in word embeddings is about uncovering the hidden structure behind these vectors trying to understand what semantic or syntactic features each dimension might represent we don't know exactly what each number stands for because the vectors are learned in an unsupervised way however by visualizing the vectors such as plotting the heat maps or color coding the vector values we can begin to form hypotheses for example we might use a color gradient where highly negative values appear purple highly positive values appear red let's say we only visualize just the first 10 dimensions out of the typical 300 dimensional embeddings so when we are going to do it an interesting pattern might emerge case study 1 living versus non living in this example we explore a set of words that belong to two broad categories living entities man woman boy girl non living objects banana and water so here you can see the color coded plot for every embedding values in the dimension 6 all the words that represent living entities such as man woman boy girl so strong negative values basically purple whereas non living objects like banana and water do not show such value this pattern suggests that dimension 6 may be encoding some latent attributes related to the concept of life it appears to distinguish between things that are alive versus inanimate objects but there is a caveat we can't definitely say that dimension 6 represent living versus non living this is simply hypothesis formed by observing patterns in the data the dimension could also represent some other correlated attributes such as agency interaction or social presence features that are commonly associated with living things in language uses the takeaway is that even though we cannot assign an exact meaning the consistency across related word supports the idea that embeddings capture meaningful internal structure this allows us to reason the language model in a more interpretable way Let's move to a group of emotional words. In positive we have happy and joy, in negative we have sad. These words are plotted across 10 dimensions and their values are color coded using a gradient that helps us visually interpret their structure. So my observation for this one is that across most dimensions, happy and joyful shows a very similar pattern. Values across dimensions like D1, D2, D3 and D7 are nearly aligned. However, there is an important distinction at dimension 6. You can see that happy has a value of 0.04, joyful has also a similar value like 0.17, but sad has a very high value that is 0.86. This suggests that dimension D6 might be playing a role in encoding emotional polarity, potentially distinguishing joy from sadness. However, this is only a hypothesis. It is also possible that D6 represents something correlated but not directly interpretable, like emotional intensity or context frequency. Let's analyze a completely different semantic group: human life stages. So we have four words: baby, child, adult, teenager, and these all words have notably similar vectors. especially around dimensions d2 d3 and d5 one interesting pattern appears at dimension d8 baby has a value of 1.30 child has a value of 1.17 adult has a value of 0.79 and teenager has a value of 0.98 this descending trend could hypothetically relate to something like available free time a concept that decreases as one transition from childhood to adulthood again this is purely speculative A common misconception is that each dimension in the word vector represents a specific interpretable trait. For example, gender, age, positivity, 
embeddings are learned in an unsupervised way and the dimensions are not explicitly labeled. Similar meanings lead to similar vector compositions. Interpretability often comes from relative comparisons, not from absolute values. So while it could be tempting to say dimension 6 represents joy or dimension 8 represents age, these are merely hypotheses formed from visual patterns and domain knowledge. We can never be completely certain, but we can just observe and reason. What to vec and similar embeddings methods like GLOF or fast text were game changers. However, there is a limitation. Each word gets a static vector, no matter where or how it's used. But many words are polysemous. They have multiple meanings. The word bank in bank account versus river bank is a classic example. One is about finance, the other is about a river's edge. In a word to vec embedding space, bank has to be a single point. So the model might place it somewhere between the two meanings or closer to the most frequent meaning. This is not ideal for understanding sentences because the computer can't fully tell which sense is meant just for that one vector. In fact, with static embeddings, each word has only one vector, so it cannot explicitly distinguish between meanings in different contexts. Modern transformer-based models like BERT and GPT solve this by using contextual embeddings instead of a fixed vector per word type. These models generate a fresh vector for each word token based on the sentence it is in. In other words, the representation of bank in the finance context will be completely different from the representation of bank in the river context. How do they do this? They use deep neural networks, that is transformers, that look at the entire sentence and even surrounding sentences when encoding a word. The result is that the meaning of the word as used is captured in its vector. So the same word can have multiple possible vectors depending on its company in that instance, fulfilling the context idea in a very direct way. What's remarkable is that these contextual embeddings helps the model to handle different kind of nuances of language. If you ask Bert to fill in the blank for, I went to the DAS to deposit money. It knows that the blank should be something like bank in the finance sense. If you instead say, I sat on the DAS by the water, it will predict bank, which is in the river sense, as a likely word. And it knows these are different meanings. Under the hood, the internal vector for bank in the first sentence will be closer to other finance related words and in the second sentence it will be closer to river related words. We have moved from a single static map of words to a flexible context sensitive mapping. Transformer models use these embeddings in each layer of the network especially as a part of output or attention calculations. At the end of the day, contextual embeddings allow language models to disambiguate word meanings on the fly making them much more powerful for understanding text than any static lookup table of word vectors could be. So to summarize everything, word embeddings are fundamental technique that converts text into numbers while preserving the important information about the meaning and context of the word. We started with naive representations, IDs, one-hot vectors, bag of words, etc. That were easy for computers but lost the essence of language. We then introduced the context of learning from language by training models to predict words from their neighbors and vice versa. By doing this, we obtain dense vector embeddings like word to vec that encode the semantic of words placing similar words near each other in the vector space. We also saw how to measure similarity in the space using cosine similarity, effectively letting a computer calculate semantic closeness. Modern large language models have taken embeddings even further. They generate contextual embeddings, meaning the vector for a word can change depending on the sentence, which handles ambiguous words and nuances in a powerful way. So that's it for this video. And this side Mayan Pratap Singh. I am actively creating AI related content on LinkedIn and Twitter, sharing practical implementations, learning insights and informative posts about the developments in this field. Let's connect on both platforms. You will find my handles linked in the description below. I would love to hear about your AI projects and exchange ideas about what you are working on. If you haven't taken notes during this video, don't worry. This entire lecture is based on a comprehensive blog post I wrote a month ago. You can use that as your reference guide. The link is also in the description. At last, if you are serious about mastering ML deep learning or LLM concepts, you can subscribe to this channel for that. Thank you.